Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about what's probably the most famous supernova ever, at least historically speaking. We're going to be talking about the very surprising discovery coming from right here in the so-called Kepler's supernova, also known as SN1604 because it occurred back in 1604. And we're going to find out what the scientists recently found here and also a few other details about this beautiful creation. Let's talk about this and welcome to What The Man. So back in 1604, back when the scientists didn't really know about galaxies or about supernova, about neutron stars or white dwarfs, and back when we still were trying to figure out the whole planetary motion situation, the scientist by the name of Johannes Kepler, who lived in Germany back then, heard the news that something unusual was going on in the night skies, and so he decided to very very thoroughly document everything he was observing, creating this beautiful book that you can also find in the description below, known as Di Stella Nova, essentially the new star. And this was of course an extremely new and very very unusual object that they were observing, something that none of them have ever seen before and they weren't even sure what it was. The original proposition by the Italian observer who found it, whose picture unfortunately I couldn't find but whose name you can see right here, was that this was probably some sort of a unusual cometary gas expulsion somewhere in the solar system, but nobody really knew what it was. Back then the scientists kind of started to understand comets, but they didn't really know these distant stars and these distant explosions were even possible. But the reason this supernova today is known as the Kepler supernova, even though he wasn't the first to discover it, was really because of this. The over 200 pages long document that essentially very very thoroughly describes what he was observing, which also makes this the first very very thorough observation of a stellar phenomenon. And as I mentioned, you can find this book in the description below, you can actually go through this, but it might not really be that useful because it's written entirely in Latin. The language that I don't think many of us speak anymore. And I guess what's really interesting is that back then the Latin was technically the language of science, whereas today, for the most part, it's become English. And I've always found this really fascinating how the transitions like this happen throughout the ages. Because obviously in the past the language was also French and German, and for all we know in the future it might even be Chinese. At least that's what China is trying to do right now. Anyway, we're getting distracted here. So this book is pretty cool, it's pretty amazing, but I don't think many of us will be able to get much out of it. But because of this book and because of the observations, hundreds of years later, scientists once again were able to discover the Kepler supernova in the night skies and study it in more detail with much much better perspective and of course with understanding of what they were actually looking at this time. And what's interesting is that in the last few years we've discovered quite a lot of interesting things about it. And interestingly, one of these things, and unfortunately the mistake in this simulation, is that there is no star in the middle, there's no remnant. It seems to be completely empty, and this is a bit unusual. But the reason why the scientists think it's empty is because even though normally a white dwarf will go supernova when it siphons enough mass from its partner star and the partner star should still stay behind, in this case it's very likely that the supernova that we observed back in 1604 happened for a different reason. It was most likely because of a collision between two white dwarfs that essentially self-destructed. And so having looked at this for many decades, the scientists are now pretty certain there is nothing there in the middle. But the new discoveries, the papers for which you can find in the description below, actually identified something else really unusual, something we didn't expect. And that something has to do with the ejecta from the supernova that you see in this simulation. All of this was filmed by the Chandra Observatory using X-ray telescopes and this is sort of what you can see right here. You can even see the expansion of this bubble from the center. But interestingly, if you measure the speed of the expansion here, it's surprisingly really, really high. Way, way higher than the scientists anticipated. Remember, this happened over 400 years ago. So the assumption was that by now it should have already slowed down a little bit the actual expansion should have slowed down to maybe a few hundred kilometers per second. But the thing is, when the scientists analyzed these little blobs, and specifically looking at these x-ray blobs that you see right here, they were able to identify the average velocity for this at around 5000 kilometers per second. 
with the maximum velocity in certain locations being over 10,000 km per second, which is of course roughly around 3-4% to the speed of light. That is a huge velocity, and since this is something that happened 400 years ago, it actually is really unexpected, it's not something scientists thought would be happening. There's really no explanation right now for why this was such an extremely powerful supernova with such really really high velocity emissions, but one possible solution here is that this was an extremely massive collision between two really really large white dwarfs. In other words, it was a collision between two white dwarfs that were already reaching the mass where they would go supernova anyway. And in this case, once they collided, that's when the extremely powerful emissions started to appear. And they haven't stopped for the past 400 years. But another explanation here involves the region around the supernova, and it's probably just not very dense, or has these really large chunks of matter that are creating these funneling effects. And because of these funneling effects, certain parts of the supernova remnant are moving faster than other parts. But even the average speed here is still much higher than it should be. And so there are definitely a lot of things here we just don't understand right now. But because this is the closest remnants to us that was visually observed by scientists 400 years ago, it's still the most interesting supernova remnant that we have. And by the way, this is also the only supernova we know of that occurred in the Milky Way galaxy. The only other two supernova that most likely occurred between this one and today were unfortunately not visible to anyone because back then the scientists didn't really know what they were looking at and the supernova themselves were also unfortunately hidden by a lot of dust. We only know about them today because we've seen the remnants and tried to calculate their age. The youngest one is actually this right here, it's known as G1.9, and it most likely happened sometime around when Einstein was proposing his ideas. So possibly around 1900s, 1905. But we don't really know, mostly because nobody actually saw the flash itself. The second youngest one is Cassiopeia A that you can usually see with a telescope, but uh, this one happened maybe about 300 years ago. Once again, nobody really saw it, at least not that we can confirm, so Kepler supernova is really the one that scientists are really curious about because there are very thorough observations from Kepler himself and because now we can actually analyze a lot of things using modern telescopes. And one thing I forgot to mention is that this was at a distance of about 20,000 light years away from us, so obviously this was not dangerous at all and pretty far away. But the star that it created, the actual flash that it created, was visible even during the day. So this was a pretty exciting new discovery that back then scientists were scratching their heads about and it lasted for roughly around a year or so. The supernova was also recorded by astronomers from China, Korea and different Arabic countries, but unfortunately their observations were not as detailed as Kepler's. But it looks like even after 400 years we still have so much to learn about what really happened here and most importantly, because type 1a supernova are very important in uh, cosmology in general, we also want to understand what led to this type of a type 1a supernova, and of course how it relates to other supernova we've been observing across the universe. Because as you might remember, these types of supernova today are used as the so-called measurement candles. We usually use their total brightness to try to determine distances across the universe. As a matter of fact, a lot of the measurements across the universe and a lot of studies in cosmology rely on the understanding of these type 1a supernova and their total release of energy and of course their total brightness. So learning more about them, especially by studying Kepler supernova, is actually important for us in order to understand the universe better. And it looks like we have one more mystery to try to answer when it comes to these supernova. How is it that some of them can be so powerful and, of course, so much brighter than others? because it's very likely that this was one of the brighter supernovas in the vicinity. But until we learn more about Kepler supernova or about type 1a supernova in general, that's really all I wanted to mention in this video. Check out the book that I mentioned in the description below, I mean just for the sakes of the fact that this is a book that was written 400 years ago when someone was observing this beautiful creation. And Subscribe if you haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying this wonderful person t-shirt that I'm wearing right now as well. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.